My name is Charlene Margo, and I am the proud co-founder of Nonprofit, The Parent Venture. We are delighted to have with us tonight, Dr. Heidi Kasevich, who will be talking to you about the power of quiet leadership. Welcome, Heidi, Dr. Kasevich. Thank you so much, Charlene. I am so thrilled to be here. Um, let me get started. Perfect. Super. All right. So, so how do you define leadership? This is my starting question in all of the leadership that I work, that I work, that I do with high school students as an educator, a coach, and an author. It's the one I use when I when beginning and ending any leadership journey with high school students. The answer. My work with students and faculty and parents across the nation shows that we tend to associate a leader with someone who is daring, alpha, gregarious, and bold. He takes charge rather than takes care, and he gives orders rather than listens to others. As one educator affirms, leadership is a popularity contest where kids are expected to run the show, to be chiefs. And the so-called halo effect ensures that extroverted leaders, thinking on one's feet, delivering rousing speeches and loving the spotlight are often perceived as more effective because they fit the stereotype of a successful leader in 21st century America. Our introverted students, they often end up feeling as though they do not have leadership potential because they are not inclined to be louder outgoing, to love the podium or to be in control. They often feel misjudged, misunderstood or overlooked in our schools today across the nation. Susan Cain in Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, connects the extrovert ideal, or loudership, um, with, the ch with charming, charismatic, outgoing, action-oriented personalities to the rise of the industrial and media ages, which has made it seem as though you couldn't succeed in life unless you were a fast-talking, charming, charismatic salesman, a stark contrast to the culture of character of the late 19th century, which valued inner strength, integrity, and the good deeds you performed while no one was looking. As author and psychologist Linda Silverman states, the American dream is to be extroverted. We push our children to be people who need people. In schools, educators often define participation as quantity of speech and assign a grade to the number of times kids raise their hands in our classes which can sometimes count for as much as 50% of their grade. Often a teacher pauses just one second before calling on students. Those who process information quickly are at an advantage under these conditions. In fact, research shows that talkative people have been rated as smarter, better looking, more interesting, and more desirable as friends. Another study found that a person's actual influence is often over overlooked for airtime, the amount of time they spend talking. You can see this expectation in this particular anecdotal comment on the screen, which is the staple of report writing in schools that assess quantity over quality of speech. And note the but still. Our schools also tend to be crowded, noisy places where the walls have come down so that it can be hard to find a place for privacy. There is an expectation for constant social interaction as collaboration and group work dominate our teaching and learning experiences. As one student said, you're always expected to be doing something or going somewhere and are discouraged from spending time alone. As part of our cultural ethos, we see the ambitious as action oriented and time poor. Busyness has become a status symbol. One of my quiet students in the summer leadership camp told the group that her preferences for solitude during recess were seen as a sign of a learning disability. When I was younger, I was labeled as shy, anxious, and slow. It's when you believe that something's wrong with you, the world becomes a terrifying place. In fact, 41% of teachers leave the profession within five years of entering it, a statistic associated with constant social interaction. During my years as a classroom history and leadership teacher, teacher at schools in New York City, I used to begin by telling students that I spent my entire middle and high school years with a fear of speaking up in class. 
I was told repeatedly, just come out of your shell, which shut me down rather than help me to flourish. In fact, I didn't come out of my shell until I found the French language. The language and culture freed me to be myself. First as a ninth grade participant in the French language exchange program, and later as a French major in college. I actually spent a year abroad in Paris. And I want to add that so much of being an exchange student involves listening so as to better understand the other culture or language too, but you have to learn to speak up. To quote a student I interviewed for my next book, Silent Talk, Setting the Stage for Introverts to Thrive, she said, it's sink or swim, or you don't have friends. <laughs> now today, here you can see a rather joyous me. I made it to Paris um, last summer, first time after COVID. My first teaching job was as a French language instructor at New York U University. I had to share my passion with others and I loved the experience. I paid particular attention to nurturing the quiet leaders in my classroom. Today, my mission is a little bit larger, more expansive. It's my mission to guide entire school communities to create temperament inclusive learning cultures where introverts are as valued as their extroverted counterparts for their ability to learn and lead. A temperament inclusive classroom characterized by a balance between collaborative learning and independent work, group work and solitude. It's one that prizes quality over quantity of speech, deep listening and writing as varied forms of engagement. As we cultivate a culture of quiet in our schools, we honor the learning style of a third to a half of our students who are likely to fall on the introverted side of the introvert extrovert spectrum. Leadership begins with self-awareness. Let's begin with creating a common vocabulary around what it means to be an introvert. Introversion extroversion considered the north and south of temperament, about 40 to 50% heritable, this accounts for about half of our identities. I'm going to define introversion extroversion based on a groundbreaking study by Susan Cain's Quiet Revolution and UPenn's Scott Berry Kaufman. They teamed up to develop an introvert extrovert assessment that focuses on two key aspects of our identities, of our biogenetic natures, our sensitivity to stimulation on the one hand and our sensitivity to rewards on the other. I have to say that I also highly recommend the personality assessment in Susan Cain's Quiet. It's the one that my son and I took together on the beach before he headed off to college. And I believe that to this day, that moment of realization that we are both deep introverts has positively, positively shaped our relationship and helped him to see how his quiet nature is a strength and a point of deep connectivity with others. Introversion fundamentally has to do with sensitivity to stimulation from the outside world. Introverts feel most happy and alive in quiet settings and show a sensitivity to social and sensory stimuli, from crowds to bright lights to a loud bang. As an example, psychologist Russell Gein gave math problems to introverts and extroverts with varying levels of background noise. He found the extroverts did fine when the background noise was loud, but the introverts did much better when the background noise was softer. Such high reactivity to input from the outside world is detectable in babies as young as four months of age. They show signs of distress when reacting to a variety of st stimuli, such as a mobile swaying overhead, balloons popping by arching their backs, crying, thrashing their legs. These are the ones who just might salivate more when tasting a tart stimulant such as lemon juice, according to the pioneering work of Hans Isaac in 1967, the infamous lemon juice test. Note, if you look at the image on the right, note that stimulation can feel quite painful, especially if it's intense. So introverts are driven to reduce outside stimulation as a way to find their sweet spot between quiet on the one hand and social activity on the other. So ask yourself, did your child as a baby cry or thrash around when in places where there was lots of noise? Did they shut down, cling to a safe person, or potentially have a meltdown in the face of crowds, 
new people in situations or busy environments. Does this still happen today? But that's not all. Introversion, extroversion also has to do with our sensitivity to rewards in the environment, which is connected with the neurotransmitter dopamine in our brains. Dopamine is a chemical released in the brain that pro provides the motivation to seek external rewards. The dopamine pathway is more active in the brains of extroverts who feel energized at the expectations of rewards in the environment, kind of a bubbly buzz, such as winning a medal in a soccer game, getting your name in the school newspaper, making friends with a stranger in the cafeteria, or getting called on in class. These external rewards motivate introverts less. Instead, introverts prefer to use a slightly different brain pathway, one that is activated by acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter that is also linked to pleasure, but one that makes us feel good when we turn inward, quietly reflecting, concentrating, and focusing on one thing for a long period of time. So let's ground um, sensitivity to stimulation and sensitivity to rewards in something very concrete. This works very well with um, in my leadership work, you know, with students, with children, trying to understand. So what does this all mean? What are what are my styles? What are my preferences? So I'm going to focus in on three here tonight social recharging and processing. So the social style of the introvert. I prefer small gatherings and one-on-one -on -one conversations. For the extrovert, I thrive on group work and meeting new people. Recharging style. For the introvert, I need to spend time alone after team events. For the extrovert, oh, I'm exhausted. What shall we do together after school? And the processing style. For the introvert, I prefer to think before I speak. I weigh options before making decisions. Please don't call on me. For the extrovert, I process my ideas out loud. I have a just do it approach to risk. I'm usually one of the first to raise my hands. As you can see, these styles are quite different and it is very important for us to have self-awareness, frankly, if we're going to get along. And frankly, it's also important for those leaders to be able to understand the diverse styles of their teammates so as to actualize the potential of all of the team members. So once we understand those introverted preferences, socializing, recharging, processing, the most prevalent misconceptions about introverts stand out. They are shy, they are antisocial, and they are slow. I recommend these linguistic shifts um, to reframe these prevalent myths of introverts today. In social situations, we can often be blindsided when it comes to labels. So having a quiet leadership antidote at the ready can be exceedingly helpful. So I wanna focus on shy and antisocial. Shyness is the fear of social judgment. Both introverts and extroverts can be shy. In fact, when we tell introverts, as I said about myself, to just come out of your shell, it can actually foster shyness. If you're not inclined to raise your hand first and you were told to do so without support, it can really foster a fear of what others think of you. I don't wanna speak up because I might get it wrong. So you can say instead, or your quiet leader can learn to say, I take it all in and I don't miss a thing. Moving on to the label antisocial. Introverts are not antisocial. They have their own style, as we discussed earlier. And here I wanna share a confession from a mother of twin girls, one introverted and the other extroverted. A mother who's now exceedingly understanding about personality types in a way that brings her closer to her daughters, but did not understand fully when they were in middle school. So she said, while we can often identify introversion in partners and other adults, we can miss it in our own children. My extrovert would invite half the class and have a dance party for her birthday. My introverted daughter would have three to four friends over and they would sit in the living room, having English tea, listening to classical music. And I remember saying, don't you want to invite more people? Don't you know that if you invite more people, you're going to get invited to more parties? Instead, 
some of the language you can use or your quiet leader can say is, I take time to get to know people really well. I need to recharge after socializing. I'm comfortable working alone. So based on this self-awareness, what can we do to set the stage for our introverted students and children to thrive as leaders? So my approach is threefold. Turn preferences into strengths, support stretches, things that are uncomfortable for introverts to do, and let's try and make it comfortable, <laughs> and help recharge. They do all go together. Strength, stretch, and then restore. So let's start with strengths. This is a strengths-based leadership model. There's a 2014 Quiet Revolution study with the Values in Action Institute that revealed that there are correlations between temperament and character strengths, of which according to positive psychology, there are 24. It's important to note that we all have greater and lesser strengths and that this trio of quiet leadership strengths, humility, perspective, and prudence can be learned, practiced, and cultivated by everyone. And together, in my opinion, they constitute a model of quiet leadership. So let's start with humility. There's been really exciting research done recently on humility, essentially putting mission on others first. Humility has come to mean, even amongst middle schoolers, a lack of self-esteem, a sign of weakness. So let's set the record straight. A humble ego is an indication of a healthy self-esteem, one that acknowledges one's own limitations, and yet has a firm sense of self-worth and value, transcending the self, without losing the self. As you, see from, as you can see from this quotation, from why humble leaders make the best leaders, a humble leader works to harness input from everyone, admits they don't have all the answers, seeks constructive feedback and credits others. It was former senior vice president of people operations at Google, Laszlo Bach, who decreed that humility is what he is looking for in new hires, because humble leaders enable team members to feel included, which is a direct link to innovation. The energy that can be ignited in organizations with humble leadership is dramatic. Research reveals that humble leaders can create cultures in schools in which teachers are more satisfied with their jobs, students attain higher test scores, and discipline problems decline. Moving on to perspective in leadership. Perspective, what I call listen, listening expansively, does involve highly effective listening. One that involves deeply taking in other, others' ideas and opinions, which builds trust, and then offering advice or sharing ideas based on the ability to see the big picture, such as the horizon from the balcony or the forest through the trees, considering systems as a whole, life lessons, and ethical conduct. There was in fact a seminal study by Wharton School's Adam Grant, which showed that teams perform better, perform better when led by a good listener. As it turns out, according to his uh, studies, more t-shirts can be folded or more, more pizza delivered when the leader solicits input from proactive team members. And more often than not, that quiet introvert in a class or meeting who may not be seen as contributing is in fact contributing, working out a solution that others missed by listening expansively. Quiet listening energy is also a calming presence that can affect team performance in positive ways. Deep listening coupled with deep thinking are introvert superpowers. Moving on to prudence. According to the Values in Action Institute, prudent leaders are careful about their choices and do not say or do things that they might regret. They weigh options before making decisions. Deliberate risk-taking has served these two introverted leaders quite well. So Christine Tsai co-founded 500 Startups, which is now 500 Global, a venture capital firm which now has over $2.7 billion in assets, and with the mission to uplift people and economies around the world through entrepreneurship. How did she do it? Number one, kind of going back to humility, she places the spotlight on others. She says in an interview, it's really important for your team 
to, to not just feel empowered, but to actually be empowered. I have a very good close relationship with everyone I work with. That's humility. And as a prudent leader, Sai's style is also shaped and strengthened by her belief in process and structure around short-term goal-directed behavior, as well as far-sighted planning. And Warren Buffett, as Warren Buffett once said, success in investing doesn't correlate with IQ. Once you have ordinary intelligence, what you need is the temperament to control the urges that get other people into trouble when investing. His advice, don't take big risks looking for big rewards. Be patient. A famously prudent comment. And since we're talking about role models, there are many more um, introverted role models. To name a few, uh, Bill Gates, Barack Obama, Abraham Lincoln, Rosa Parks, Eleanor Roosevelt, Audrey Hepburn, um, famously introverted leaders who exemplify those character strengths of humility, perspective, and prudence. Move on now to the second of the uh, strategies here for nurturing quiet leaders, supporting stretches. So in cultivating quiet leadership, we must also be attentive to helping our introverted children and students to step outside of their comfort zones and do seemingly risky things, such as giving speeches for a club they wanna found, informing an adult about a bullying incident or a health problem, or interviewing for a spot at a summer camp or internship. This is a topic I explore in depth as it relates to acting, a profession which, like teaching, is actually filled with introverts. According to our research, it's getting into character rather than loving the spotlight, which draws introverts to become actors. And introverted actors need support in navigating all aspects of the profession, from auditioning to networking. The good news is just as introversion extroversion is a trait, adaptability is also a trait and comprises about 40% of our identity. But the catch is that we need to stretch in ways that are comfortable so that we avoid undue stress. We don't wanna snap when we stretch. So the challenge for us all is to learn to stretch while still honoring that 50% of our nature that is inborn and biogenetic and thus to preserve our authenticity. So we can scaffold meaningful and comfortable stress, um, stretching and reduce anxiety um, with a foundational principle. It's called the long runway. It's a great metaphor. The long runway refers to the extended amount of time it takes an introvert to warm up to a new situation and to participate in a new experience on their own terms. So we need to be attentive to the neurobiological fact that overstimulated introverts tend to retreat to the sidelines. The avoidance impulse will take over the approach instinct. And this can turn into canceling or simply not showing up honestly, regardless of age. <laughs> the danger is that this turning inward can also lead to withholding information that could be critical for educators or caregivers. So the long runway is all about preparation and practice. So a number, for number one, breaking big challenges into small steps, I'm going to quote Dr. Carl Schwartz. He says it beautifully. You don't help a person's fear of flying by throwing them into a 747, strapping them down, and taking them on a non-slept flight to China. You take them to the airport first. Watch the airplanes take off. Watch them land. <laughs> Have them talk to a pilot. In other words, a slow introduction, but nonetheless gently forcing them into a world in which they are afraid. And really gentle is the operative word here. Second, Engage in role-playing dress rehearsal type activities at home. Create a roadmap so that there's a concrete plan for an event before arrival. Say it's a, you know, it's a family birthday party, it's a holiday party. Um, who's gonna be there? What's it gonna look like? What's it gonna sound like? Um, and if possible, <laughs> sometimes I'm guilty of not doing this, um, always arrive early to events. Doing so allows kids to acclimate to the environment and connect with a few close friends if possible. We can call these bridge friends. 
um, at the beginning of the event. It can certainly be harder to join once groups have formed. And when possible, if possible, plan for that exit strategy. We call this the Irish exit, which can work well for parties and also for networking events as we get older. <laughs> I'm gonna stay for one hour or one and a half hours, and then I'm gonna leave to go home to recharge. So I'm gonna look at two specific stretches here. The first is verbal classroom engagement, and the second will be um, giving a speech to the entire grade. So when we think about verbal classroom engagement, it's important to kind of just set that stage to have to think about the, the model of engagement rather than participation. In this model, the energizing presence of the active listener counts just as much as verbal communication. So again, this is kind of the backdrop. So my, my approach to helping an introverts accomplish this stretch is threefold daily practice, preparation, and then in the moment. So with daily practice, I love this idea of visualizing success. I love this idea of like putting sneakers next to your bed and thinking about getting up and literally stretching or taking a short walk, even five minutes you know, around the kitchen, thinking about your success. Imagine sharing your ideas with others. So then becomes a habitual pattern. And remember that if you don't share, others won't know what you're thinking. Preparation. Introverts are wizards of preparation. So planning a few verbal contributions in advance is very important. And I also say, as I'm coaching my introverted leaders, plan to speak up early. It's usually the first few comments that anchor the, com the entire conversation moving forward. And then let's not forget to be in the moment, to be fully present, to kind of let it go. So it can be so, it can be very easy if you're very focused on what you're saying to actually forget about the introvert superpower of listening. Um, so think about showing engagement while listening, smiling, perhaps nodding, leaning in. Research shows that about 80% of what we communicate comes from these nonverbal cues and signals. It's also interesting to note that research shows that introverts tend to make eye contact while listening, but not necessarily while speaking. So that can be a stretch goal as well. Let's take it to the next level. So you have, you know, your, your introverted leader has, um, is very passionate about founding a club regarding say recycling in the neighborhood. So part of it in order to get people to sign up is a requirement is to give a speech to the entire grade. Or as in the case of my student in the summer camp, giving a speech about storytelling to the rest of the rest of the camp, which is about 200 people. So my recommendations here are same three, threefold, daily practice, preparation, and in the moment. So for daily practice, speeches come alive with personal anecdotes. I counsel those giving speeches to keep a journal, jot down ideas. Why does this mission energize you? How is your passion connected to the larger purpose of the community? Capture these thoughts on a daily basis. So then it's to infuse your speech with a personal touch and then just let it come from your heart. Put the mission first. Mission first, so then you're not even thinking about you know, yourself at all. Preparation. Our introverts are again, wizards of preparation. So know your topic well, know as much as you can about it. You're the expert. And note that again, it's often mastery of a topic that helps quiet kids to break through their verbal inhibitions. I'll never forget back in high school when I had to give, um, give a speech um, to the entire grade, um, what really got me going was my passion for gymnastics. I was a gymnast at the time. And when I, when I want, when I was able to then share, kind of do a backflip in front of everyone, it really just gave me a sense of, a sense of ease. I wanted to share my passion with others. Um, so 
preparation. Oh, right. So another thing about preparation is I counsel my introverted leaders to visit the presentation space in advance if it's in person. Um, so you can just kind of get, get have that long runway approach and then practicing your speech. Ask for feedback. Parents, caregivers, um, your pets, you know, stuffed animals, they might not give such great feedback, but the idea is that you're practicing, you're totally prepared. And then in, in the moment, back in that moment, so with all that preparation, you're remembering to, I like to say, um, stand with gravity on your side, have your feet firmly planted on the ground, your shoulders back. I think of the tree pose in yoga with a strong, confident spine. You might be speaking softly, but with conviction and again, letting that passion, for whatever you're talking about, shine forth, a kind of a bubbly excitement about, about your mission. So then after stretching, we need to restore. As that mother of the twins said, who knows her children so well, my introvert needs that time. She needs that recharge time. If she doesn't get it, it's really uncomfortable for her. So when we stretch in the name of a core, core personal project, a stretch goal that's meaningful and manageable, it is imperative that we take, introverts take a restorative niche, restorative niche. This is a phrase that Cambridge University's Dr. Brian Little coined. He was deeply introverted and exceedingly dynamic. He used to retire to the bathroom after receiving standing ovations at Harvard to restore his energy. He did that until he noticed that audience members used to follow him to the stalls and continue to pose questions. And I have to say, in all of my years as a classroom uh, history and leadership teacher, the one place that I could be charged was the restroom. So we actually really need to build in more restorative niches in our, the physical plants of our schools. I wanna add that without recharge time, stretching to the point of self-negation, in other words, an introvert who's trying to become an extrovert rather than stretch in the name of a mission or core personal project can lead to health problems, including anxiety, depression, and compromised immune functioning. And our adolescents are particularly at risk for compromising authenticity for the sake of social status. So I'm gonna break down the restorative niche into two parts, quiet times and quiet spaces with some strategies. So for an introvert, knowing when alone time can occur is essential. A daily, weekly, or monthly energy management calendar, which is similar to, of course, time management, but energy management has this personality spin to it. An energy management calendar can help immensely with events and activities that are both non-negotiable, such as going to school, and negotiable. And in that negotiable category, we can start to normalize quite quiet counterpoints to our days, such as sitting, sitting quietly and letting the mind wander, which can spark creativity, closing the door, listening to music, or just going for a walk outside, whatever it is, whatever might be your self-soothing strategy, um, you know, I just say, hey, go for it, but know when that recharge time can occur. I would say, speaking of negotiations, that the energy management calendar is incredibly helpful for mixed personality families comprised of you know, introverts and extroverts where the recharging needs can be quite divergent. So I recommend to families aim to sit down together and plan for a balance between alone time and social time, especially over the weekends or on vacations. Try to harmonize our energy needs. Quiet spaces. It's often hard to get that permission to be alone particularly in schools where being alone can be seen as being antisocial or being a loner. So for quiet spaces, whether at home or at school, remember that introverts do need permission to be alone and unseen, 
control over light and noise, and sensory balance with calm, warm influences. So that environment matters so much to the, to the introvert. So I ask, does your introvert have a quiet space at home? And this question actually sparks a lovely memory um, of the corner I had in my bedroom in, in lower school. I had a lime green beanbag chair with dim lights and my little house on the prairie books. <laughs> Just loved my reading corner. Thank my parents for that lovely corner of my room. Um, and then for schools, I wanna tell you the story of Peaceful Lunch. This is a, the brainchild of a quiet, friendly educator, one of the original participants of the Quiet Ambassador Program. So in an interview, she said, like many elementary schools, lunch, lunchtime is nothing short of he hectic. She worked at a large public school in New York City. For four periods in a row, more than 200 students cram into a rectangular box with booming acoustics. Whistles and microphones are needed to keep things under control. And then peaceful lunch. Out of some 900 students, over 400 of them signed up, which is consistent with that third to a half of our student population being more introverted. During each lunch period, we pulled a group of 18 to 20 kids to a separate location. We lined tables with butcher paper, provided colored pencils and calming glitter jars. It was drastically different. It's a drastically different environment. Some students just ate, some doodled, while others talked quietly to a child nearby. It was quite beautiful and they seemed to enjoy it. And I want to add that the initiative was actually so successful that there was a wait list for peaceful lunch and they ended up actually calling on the parent population to help staff this um, wildly successful um, initiative, Peaceful Lunch. Let's zoom out for a moment. I wanna put a spotlight on the connection between solitude and creativity for introverts and extroverts alike. So those quiet times and spaces, how do they foster creativity? And here I wanna say that rumor has it that Einstein dreamed up the theory of relativity when riding a bicycle, quietly. <laughs> and JK Rowling, the wizard Harry Potter, while riding a train. In her interview, she says she didn't even have a pen. As Columbia University's Scott Barry Kaufman explains, the part of our brain that usually leads to our most creative ideas, the default mode network, works best when we're quiet and alone. The mind must have the space to settle down if it is to come up with original insights that make for creative work. So embedding opportunities for silent reflection in our lives allows us all build, to build self-awareness, enhance motivation, deepen knowledge, and spark imagination. Back to the original question. How do you define leadership? Hopefully we have quite a different definition at this point. And here I'm gonna bring it back to two children that I mentioned earlier. First, the student who was labeled as shy, anxious, and slow. After the GCLI Leadership Academy, she reached out to let me know that she had started a feminist literary magazine for young Chinese women. We have been steadily working towards our mission of quietly shaking the world with the inclusion and illumination of young female voices. Following her passion, her mission, and really trying to make a difference in her community. Quite remarkable. And then I have words here, a different kind of anecdotal comment. Again, doesn't seem at all like <laughs> the extrovert ideal ones that I showed, showed you earlier on. This is a quiet, friendly coach about a track co-captain who captured his quiet leadership strengths in just a few words. And full disclosure here, the introverted track co-captain is actually my son. Do you recall that time we had together um, reading Quiet? He said he had reserved an unassuming style of leadership as track co-captain, which was highly valued by his teammates. Runners experienced unprecedented success during his senior year. 
You don't need to be loud to lead. So my call to action is really to broaden definitions of leadership. People of diverse personality styles can lead and everyone can acquire the broad range of skills necessary to lead a group effectively. And here I'm gonna turn it over to another student. Um, she was a participant, an introverted high school senior on a leadership exchange program that I led several years ago to Zambia and South Africa. In the bus on the way home, uh, actually to the airport, we were asked that question, how do you define leadership? And this is what she said, I couldn't say it more perfectly. A leader helps others to reach their full potential. Nobody has all the answers, no one person can solve all global problems, but a good leader recognizes the strengths of those around them and builds teams that can create incredible change. So combining self-awareness with passion and purpose, eventually, and this is my hope, it's the student leaders themselves who can set the stage for everyone to thrive. Thank you for your attention. And at this point, turn it back over to Charlene. Oh, Heidi, Dr. Kasovich, that was amazing. We've never had so many emotional emojis flowing through an event. So we know that you're reaching the hearts of people with us tonight. We have great questions coming in from the audience. Thank you, thank you for these wonderful ones. I myself, I'm a very long time, I call myself a recovering shy person, which people don't believe because I stand on stages now and do this for a living. But as a child, I was so shy, I couldn't call Macy's to see if they were open. I couldn't even use the phone. So here we go. Good questions, everybody. What, here's the, here's the first one, I think a great place to start. What steps could be taken to undo the effects of being shamed for shyness over multiple years? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's really understanding the self first, you know, the, the difference between shyness and introversion um, and just kind of owning you know, your introverted nature and you know, understanding that, um, that fear of, of getting it wrong is not something you necessarily have to live with. You know, that going back to that quiet leadership an antidote, um, no, I, I, I take it in and I, I, don't, I don't miss a thing. So I think having that, you know, that vocabulary around, you know, around your strengths um, as an introverted leader can be exceedingly helpful, but it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And um, it honestly, you know, you, you called yourself a recovering shy person. I mean, it can take a long time to kind of unravel, um, you know, those, those labels. Um, so that, that would be, that would be my advice. Absolutely. My mother used to always say to me, why are you so shy? And I remember thinking that's not helping. Yeah. No, it actually right. does. Make it, it makes it worse. <laughs> it makes it worse. Right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> really are afraid, are afraid to speak up at that point. Exactly. Great questions, everyone. Thank you so much. We just, we can really tell Dr. Kasovich how important this topic is for everyone. Parent asks, do you have any recommendations on helping extroverts, sorry, helping introverts prepare for college applications, which still heavily favor extroverted leaders? Um, I would say it's it's really twofold. I mean, the first is really own, owning your strengths, letting your passion shine forth. Um, think about the, the recommendations I gave for giving a speech you know, to the entire grade. It's mission for us. Like what, what ignites your energy? Think about that energy. What are you passionate about? And how can that translate into you know, making a difference in the world? But we also need, frankly, work on both sides of you know, the, the dividing line there from high schools, which is, you know, my mission is to really create temperament, help, help educators create temperament inclusive environments. And we also need that, on the other hand, in, in colleges and universities. So there's a lot of work to be done in just understanding kind of a broader notion of engagement rather than participation. Um, so there's, there's work to be done that I would say kind of come from a place of, you know, of strength. And then we talked about 
um, kind of the vulnerabilities of, of stretching. I mean, these are real, real stories. We've been kind of using that, the, that trio of strength, stretch, and restore, kind of demonstrating that self-awareness, um, I think could, could be incredibly helpful. Absolutely true. So in a related question, parent asks, can strong-willed or extroverted children also need restorative time? Absolutely. Yes. And it can look um, very different for extroverts. Um, if you remember the kind of the quotation I read, um, you know, I'm, I'm exhausted after school. It's been really, really busy. You know, perhaps there are, you know, there's no passing time with um, lots of bells and noise and activity. And the extrovert might say, yeah, I need to recharge by actually going out, you know, having some sort of social activity. Now, that's not always true. Um, extroverts often also need downtime too. And I think solitude is is actually a muscle that we can strengthen. And so the more I think we can embed cultures of quiet into our families and into our, into our schools, actually everyone's going to benefit. So I, I wouldn't wanna say that it's just, you know, extroverts always have to socialize. No, I think they also do need, do need quiet times to, to recover, quiet times and quiet spaces. It just really depends on, um, you know, what's gone, gone on during the day, during the week, during the month. And really as human beings, we're all introverts and extroverts alike, you know, really trying to find our sweet spot between calm and excitement. And so I think that notion of, you know, finding your sweet spot and then just thinking about, well, what if you, if you as a family say carve out, you know, a recharge time, having that conversation, what's my best way to recharge? And for the extrovert, it actually, it really might be some more quiet. It really, it well, really depends on the circumstances. And your example with the peaceful lunch proves that that option can be appealing to a broad swath of kids, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, the, that school was particularly the, the lunchtime and I witnessed the lunchtime at that school. I mean, it was honestly, it was like mayhem. You know, it really was loud. I and mean, she said, we need microphones, <laughs> you know, to, to keep, keep things moving. I mean, it was just... You know, so for for someone like me, like that that noise could actually really be painful. Like you just couldn't, you can't recharge in that environment. But um, yeah, I think the same um, same holds. Like it's it's important for it's important for everybody. Absolutely. So Heidi, the next question is one that I know you've spent a significant amount of your career studying. Really good question. How do we educate teachers to recognize the strengths of introverted children? I think with a lot of intentional work, um, we need we need educators to really understand uh, what it means to fall on the introvert ex extrovert spectrum. So understanding actually themselves first. I'm an advocate, of kind of you know putting on your own oxygen mask first before helping others. So developing that kind of um, self awareness, and then thinking uh, more broadly about. Uh, classroom engagement and how we can build in quiet times and spaces into our into our physical plants and into our into our busy school schedules. So building in building temperament inclusive cultures, um, nurturing the quiet leaders with this kind of methodology. Um, if we have if we have the time, those one on ones with um, you know, introverted leaders are incredibly helpful. The kind of the coaching that can go along with, you know, bringing a student, say, from being totally fearful um, about giving a speech, you know, in front of, say, the camp, like the student I mentioned. Um, first, this is a two-week program. The first day, I mean, she just said, Dr. Casper, I can't do this. Um, but it was a journey of, you know, tapping into her passion and then doing that preparation work and getting the feedback. And then finally, you know, standing in front of the podium and just owning it. You know, I have to say she just really owned her, owned her speech. Um, and then like the, you know, the last strategy for, for educators is build, build that culture of quiet, thinking about those quiet times and spaces. I, I work with schools on res, res, building restorative niches in the physical plant itself. So that is actually one of the questions I think is a good one. Parent asks, what do you do 
for your introverted child to recharge during the school day. I have a friend who's introverted child. They said, what would be your ideal classroom? And she drew a picture with all the desks facing the wall. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, and that, as you know, I mentioned the environment is, is so important. So I mean, when we have our you know kids in, in pods, <laughs> there really is, there's, there's that expectation for the constant social interaction. So, um, so sorry, remind me of your question. I, I got that image of the desks in my mind. Yeah. What can an introverted child do to recharge during the school day? Do you have any suggestions? Well, honestly, it depends. It depends on the school. I'd say as much as possible, uh, you know, try and feel, um, you know, I'm, I, I need this recharge time. I'm not antisocial. I'm not a loner. This is really important. So being able to just claim it and say, gosh, I have to get a, the recharge time. So somehow reaching out to, to the educator. If the educator doesn't know this already about the students, I hope hopefully they do. Um, but there's kind of the self-advocacy can be so important. And when uh, the self-advocacy hasn't quite yet fully developed, obviously we have um, parents as well who can talk to talk to educators. Um, so I think we need, we really need to be a, a team, parents, students, educators, administrators, we're all working on this together. But I can tell you in, in my work with schools, um, you know, around the country, this is still a work in progress. This notion of creating an introvert friendly environment. Um, it is a work in progress and it takes, you know, it, it, it takes a village, so to, so to speak. So true. So we've come to the end of our hour, Heidi, but I have one last question for you, Dr. Kasovich. Again, everyone, your questions are amazing. I wish we had time for all of them, but here we go. In today's fast paced, very live out loud social media world, what gives you hope? It's the students who, whom I mentioned, you know, the ones who are developing their leadership skills, who are owning, um, owning their passions, plan, making a plan to make a difference in the world. And it's, I have my hope in the next generation of leaders, you know, regardless of personality type, but obviously I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for the introverted leaders, for the quiet leaders, but that's what gives me hope. And I know that in terms of a quiet revolution in this country, we've made a lot of progress. There's still a lot of work to be done, um, and, but the progress that I can see in introvert inclusivity is real, and it gives me hope uh, for the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Heidi Kasovich, and thank you to everyone who joined us tonight and for all the wonderful questions. We hope that you will take this video to heart and share it with loved ones and family and colleagues and your kids, because I'll bet there are some of you that have introverted students who could really use this too. So again, so many thanks to all of you and especially to Dr. Kasovich and the Fremont Union High Schools Foundation. Take care, everybody stay safe, stay well, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you everybody, good night.